successfully breached the Great Wall of China. He led his forces to the greatest prize in the East, the capital city of Zhongdu. He besieged the city, knowing that its inhabitants could not hold out forever. Bearing down on the gleaming capital of Chengdu, Genghis Khan raised the black banner of war on his historic enemy, the Qin Dynasty. To take the heavily garrisoned capital, the Mongols would have to starve its army by eliminating Chengdu's suppliers. But first, the Khan directed his warriors to raid Qin buildings and villages surrounding Chengdu. Word of the army's wealth would spread, compelling Mongol soldiers from the north to join the fight, seeking spoils of their own. Get 
successful raids, Mongol settlers and soldiers arrived to join his army. With his numbers steadily growing, the Khan turned his attention to the capital. He sought to starve Chengdu's army by cutting off its suppliers. <laughs> Shh. 
A Qin trader made it safely into the city and reported on the Mongols' numbers and movements. Chengdu would now allocate any military supplies it received to rallying counterattacks on the steppe invaders. efforts to stop them, enough Qin traders had entered Chengdu to fully resupply its military. Choosing their moment, the Qin launched a counter-attack. put down the Qin counterattack, 
but another would soon come if Qin traders continued to resupply Chengdu's military. With Zhongdu well supplied and standing strong, it was still able to resist any direct Mongol attacks. Khan's army struck down the trader that was headed to resupply Chengdu. For every trader killed, Chengdu lost several days' worth of supplies. The Mongols were systematically choking the city and starving its garrison. Mm, Despite the Mongols' efforts to stop them, enough Qin traders had entered Chengdu to fully resupply its military. Choosing their moment, the Qin launched a counterattack. Oh, my God. 
Shut your tongue, Witsky!
the Mongols' efforts to stop them, enough Qin traders had entered Chengdu to fully resupply its military. Choosing their moment, the Qin launched a counterattack. In raising the market at Fangshen, the Mongols had severed a critical supply line to the capital. In destroying the supply markets, the Mongols denied Chengdu critical supplies, leaving its garrison weakened. As the Mongols continued to sabotage the city's supplies, Chengdu's garrison grew weaker by the day. Without hesitation, the Khan's warriors put their torches to the market at Da Sing, snuffing out weeks of Chongdu's supplies.
Mongols' efforts to stop them, enough Qin traders had entered Chengdu to fully resupply its military. Choosing their moment, the Qin launched a counterattack. The market at Tongzhou was set aflame, and with it many vital supplies intended for the city. With Chengdu devastated by starvation, the walls of the great Qin capital were devoid of soldiers, and only a diminished garrison remained. Desperate and isolated, Zhang Du could no longer resist. The time had come for Genghis Khan to launch his assault on the city. unleashed the wrath of his Mongol warriors on the heart of the beleaguered city. Great Chin Monument was put to flame. Mongol victory was within reach. The city was ready to fall in the wake of the destruction wrought by the Mongols. Zhongdu fell to the wrath of Genghis Khan's warriors, yielding great riches for the Mongol Empire. The sacking of Zhongdu would be remembered as one of Genghis Khan's most devastating victories.
But this was just the beginning of his quest to create a global empire under Mongol rule. Mongols were famed for their archers, and at the heart of their success was the clever engineering of the Mongol bow. The Mongol bow was part of a family of bows. Different cultures made these in varying shapes, but they were all made of the same materials. They were all composite bows, assembled from several parts. Lukas Novotny is a world-class horse archer and a master composite bow maker. Here we have a wooden core. That's what we begin with. The core is basically the invisible part of the bow. All we see in a bow is always the flesh. However, we never see the skeleton. Just like in a human, we know it's there. The wooden parts are fitted together with precision joints, giving the bow its distinctive shape. Okay. Now, we have the tips. They go in like so. These tips of the bow are non-bending. They act as levers that allow you to draw a much stronger bow than you normally would be able to. It's a genius bit of engineering. The next stage in assembling the composite materials is to laminate the wooden core with strips of horn. A tool called a tendiek ensures that even pressure is applied to the glued surfaces. That's, that's a lot of pressure. I have to work to really kind of keep this in place. Horn resists compression and stores energy. It is the muscles of the bow. The bow maker then applies the sinew. This is dried animal tendons that have been pounded and shredded to produce fine fibers of considerable tensile strength. Bundles of combed sinew are moistened with water, then soaked in glue made from the swim bladders of fish. The sinew is applied carefully, layer by layer. One medieval text states that all of the skill lies in the laying of the sinew. You have to really be quick with your hands. You have to make sure the fibers are straight. Keeping the sinew straight is essential. If the limbs are not perfectly true, the bow risks twisting in action. A finished Mongol bow is usually covered with leather or birch bark to protect it from the elements. But the horn is exposed. That is where the power is. In the hands of highly skilled mobile horse archers, the Mongol bow became one of the most legendary weapons in history.